Hey, I'm Mary. And I'm Jake. And you're listening to The Fly Angle, the official RDU Airport podcast. Welcome back to The Fly Angle, your favorite podcast. Yep, I'm not just bragging. It's the real deal. The Fly Angle was recently named a finalist for the 2021 ACI, or Airports Council International Community Education and Outreach Award. I'm feeling pretty proud, and I'm thanking you for turning in. You should feel proud, Mary. Yeah. It was a good accomplishment. <laughs> it's our baby. <laughs> we started this podcast last International Podcast Day, so September 30th, 2020. And it has been such a fun ride so far. Airports Council International announced that we were finalists for this category. We didn't win, didn't win. but we'll take being a finalist. Exactly. It was really nice to hear that from the industry, particularly as RDU and Austin and Knoxville and all these other airports are really starting to build up their podcasts, their airport podcasts, I should say. It's been fun to like kind of peel back some of the, the curtain on what daily airport life is like you know we've heard from people from all walks of aviation and then just in the community just people around the triangle who have been like wow we didn't know this stuff about the airport until now and so that just makes me like now like what are we going to cover next so I, i need to push my applause button but we thank you for making this so much fun for jake and i and other good news for the airport too though right jake yeah, Airports Council International gives out a number of awards every year as part of their annual awards program. And RDU actually won a big one for the overall public relations program for medium-sized airports. We have uh, uh, some hardware to bring home from that from Reno, Nevada this year uh, because the Triangle Takeoff Coalition's Carry On campaign, which we've talked about on earlier episodes of this podcast, exactly. actually won that overall PR program award. Yes. So if you hadn't had the opportunity yet, go check out that episode where we talked to members of the Triangle Takeoff Coalition. And if you haven't seen the ad in the video that ran, it still gives us all shivers when we see it. So check it out on the website, right? Yeah, you can find it on the web. You can find it on YouTube. It's kind of everywhere now. Hey, (laughs) my my friends would always tell me when they saw the ad run during football games. So it's we're right here and there yes definitely <laughs> so good things good things happening also jake do you have any travel coming up you know mary i don't have any yet but i'm getting ready to book some i am taking ideas for where i should go probably doing something after the holidays as you guys can imagine at home we stay pretty busy during the holidays at the exactly. airport so typically not a time that i take a vacation i'll take a couple of days off like at the holidays themselves but i'll probably wait until january then Maybe go somewhere warm. If you have any ideas, I'm happy to take Warm is good. I actually just got back from Puerto Rico. I had a smooth flight there. It was great. Beaches and food. I mean, I would definitely definitely recommend going Was that your first time going or have you been before? I had been, you know, I was on a cruise and we docked there. So I got to go into old San Juan and get a little feel of that. But going back now as an adult, that was when I was younger. It was a whole nother experience just being out on the beaches. And we went to San Juan and then just kind of toured up and down the island, just drove around and checked out. I think we went to 10 beaches. So I was soaking up the sun and I would definitely encourage you to go check it out. Well, that's some time coming up. Maybe maybe that'll be where I go. (laughs) I thought of you. I was out in the beach and their airport is right near the beach. You know, I mean, the island isn't a big island. But when I saw some some planes coming over, I thought of you and I didn't capture the money shot like you did on your last vacation. But I definitely thought about you when we were out there but any air mail for us we have a great question today from our friend george who actually is uh, one of rdu's longtime volunteer ambassadors if you're not familiar with that program at rdu airport we will have to tell you about all about that in a future episode uh, but for today george asks with rdu's new five left two three right runway in the planning stages i'm interested in learning if the airport authority expects to apply for any funding for this and other projects from the recently enacted $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill? Oh, great, great question, That's George. a big money question. Yeah. <laughs> so the short version is we don't really know yet. And before we dive into what RDU is going to do, maybe, Mary, tell us a little bit about the infrastructure bill itself. Okay. So the bill, which includes billions in funding for airports, was passed by Congress and signed into law by the president. And while we don't know everything yet about how much funds will be distributed, including how much funding RDU will receive, we can talk on a macro level about what the bill means to airports across the country in general. Sure. As it relates to airports, the bill contains 
something like $25 billion in new general fund revenue over the next five years for airports and air traffic control facilities as well. Let's unpack that even further. That means $15 billion for airport formula grants and then $5 billion for a new airport terminal program. So there's a little bit already out there that's clear about identifying appropriation for funds. Mm -hmm. And the funding RDU receives from the infrastructure bill will help pay for the Vision 2040 Airport Master Plan, which we have covered in previous episodes here. If you're not familiar with that plan um, and RDU's airport planning process, um, you can go to rdu.com slash vision2040 mm -hmm. and read all about it. It's really fascinating stuff. But really, the short version is we're trying to figure this out. Right. <laughs> we, know that we, we know that it's going <laughs> to go towards infrastructure. We, we aren't sure exactly yet how and what projects obviously so george coming back to your question about five left two three right um for listeners who haven't checked out an episode in a while we've talked about the need to replace that runway that is our primary runway correct um that need hasn't gone away if anything it is we're continuing to shine a light on it and as we are coming out of last year's survival budget and into a kind of a more, I hate to use the word normal, but it feels like things are getting normal back at the airport Closer now. to our numbers and sure. what we're used to experiencing here at RDU. As, as we get back to some semblance of normal, <laughs> we have to think about those capital projects that, you know, the need for replacing that runway not only didn't go away, but it's, you know, we've added a year to its shelf life. Precisely. Yeah. So make sure you stay tuned for more information. We will be first to tell you. Undoubtedly. Yeah. And so with that, uh, Mary, do you have any headlines for us? Yes, we have a lot of headlines, actually, Jake. More than 234,000 people are expected to visit RDU during the week of Thanksgiving this year. That's up 129% over 2020. Did, wow. Let me 129% over 2020. Over Thanksgiving 2020. Right. Which, you know, at that point, you, we'd started to see people filing back into the exactly. terminals and flying out. If you've never flown during the holidays, which I imagine a lot of people in this listening to this podcast have, if you've never flown during the holidays, it is, I call it our Super Bowl week. It is one of, if not the busiest weeks at RDU, right. particularly Thanksgiving over December holidays. And that's because it's over one week period. People are typically taking their time off that same week versus late December when you have it spread across multiple weeks. Right. So short version, yes, it is <laughs> very busy. Um, so the question is, are things getting back to normal? Well, yes and no. We've already used recovered maybe three fourths of its traffic to date from the beginning of the pandemic. So we're, you know, at about 75% roughly returned traffic, but the passenger mix is still heavy leisure. Um, historically, this is a business market. We have a business traveler clientele. Right. Um, it's changed a little bit. We're still seeing mostly leisure. And then as you go into Thanksgiving, it's by and large people going to see family and friends. It's not a lot of work travel. So that probably creates some unique impacts, right? It does. Everything from parking capacity to the nature of wait times throughout the airport from the moment you walk in the facility to the moment you cross into the, uh, the jet bridge. All that said... If you take nothing else away from Thanksgiving planning, <laughs> expect large crowds this month, large crowds next month that are flying for the holidays. Plan ahead. Get here two hours early. You know, book your parking online. Just do everything you can to make your travel day smooth and predictable. So if things do change on you, if your flight changes or if, you know, you have to do something different with parking than you thought you would have, at least you will have thought about it in advance. Right. Plan ahead. Pack your patience, right, Jake? Yeah, You'll hear uh, us say it over and over again. Our favorite phrase to use this time of year, pack your patience. <laughs> well, the sunshine is getting a little brighter. Spirit Airlines expanded its offering at RDU when it launched new nonstop service to Miami. The daily departure to the popular South Florida destination began on November 18th. Miami sounds nice right about I now, know, don't you think? I know, I <laughs> know. With air service, there is no normal anymore. There's continued disruption to air service from the pandemic that we're still feeling, particularly mm -hmm. in a business market like RDU. Other markets like Miami are thriving from that tourism and leisure guest base that are just absolutely swarming in. Um, on the business side, look at something like, like Boston and the Northeast. Um, American Airlines has discontinued their Boston service or announced that they're planning to discontinue their Boston service. Mm -hmm. The Northeast has been heavily impacted by the pandemic and it's primarily a business route. So that one, while we will continue to serve Boston via other carriers, we're just seeing a lot of disruption there that 
is atypical. Right, right. One aspect we're continuing to watch really closely is our international travel, right, Mary? I think we've gotten that question it's every episode for airmail. It's when is London coming back? When is Paris, Paris. coming back? <laughs> I wish I could tell you the answer to that question. Right. There's a lot of pent up market demand right there. And I just can't wait for business travel to resume so that international travel can hopefully soon follow, right? Yeah. And with the recent relaxation of those travel restrictions on flyers visiting the U.S. from international origins, we think things might start moving. We've started a new air service incentive program around international service, whether it's transatlantic or wherever. Um, we're trying to stoke the fire and get people excited about flying internationally again. Right now, when it comes back to those big two, you know, American to London, you know, as of today, looking like it might be the spring. Delta to Paris could be late summer. Those are obviously hard to pin down, but things are looking up. Once again, just stay tuned. If you're a regular TFA podcast listener, you've heard me mention the many operations that take place here at RDU on a daily basis, really an hourly basis. And often at the core of this is our operations team who ensure this place keeps going 24-7, sunrise, sundown. And one of the leaders who helps make this happen is also one of my personal favorites at the airport, Director of Airport Operations, Mr. John Graves. Welcome to the Fly Angle. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Let's dive right in. John, you came to RDU, I believe it was in May 2001, so a little over 20 years ago. That was a very different airport then. Can you describe what those early days at RDU were like? Yes, Jake. Thank you very much for the question. I started here on May the 21st of 2001. And back then when I started, you know, there were old buildings, there was old concrete, there were old policies, old procedures, some written down, many not written down. And most of the stuff was by word of mouth. You know, there were, there were people transitioning in, people transitioning out. There weren't many airlines here at the time. So it was just a different culture, different environment altogether. And then in September of 2001, that's when everything just went chaotic. So sure. six months in into it, and then just things just changed for either the build or the worst, depending upon how you look at it. Yeah, I've, we've heard from other folks who talked about that being kind of a seminal moment for obviously all airports. RDU's, you know, no different. Do you remember anything specific that like kind of came out of that? That you know, I guess the before time where everything was word of mouth. Did that change kind of around that moment, or start to change around that moment? Well, it did. It changed in in, in my opinion in two ways. Number one, when I started, it was only two operations officers. So obviously, we weren't a full time department that worked twenty four seven three sixty five. And secondly, there wasn't a lot of other entities within the organization that was really, really supportive of airport operations. Oh. But after September the 11th, 2001, the operations expanded mm -hmm. to include just about every entity, every department, every organization on the airport. Because, you know, the federal government says, OK, I want to put planes down and I want to put them down now. You know, people tend to get a little <laughs> bit of... Uh, sure. um, interested in what's going on on the airport at that point. Sure. So they want to be part of that process. From the, the federal government side, you're adding a TSA checkpoint in each terminal, but you're also from the airport authority side. I imagine there's some expansion to the operations division as it related to like law enforcement and other aspects, right? That's... Absolutely, yeah. We had a smaller size law enforcement footprint uh, at that time. Obviously, we had a smaller size uh, operations department at that time. We had a smaller size communication center at that time. You know, our batching office was probably two people deep at that time. So after that, you know, it was recognized that in order for us to move forward from this tragedy, we need to have people in places that can support whatever actions occur. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you don't know what's going to happen in the airport. You know, you've seen one airport, you've seen one airport. And no two days are ever the same in airport <laughs> right. operations. Sure. So you have to be prepared for the unprepared. And, and that was the thought process back then. And I think it's still pretty much the same today. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, switching gears just a little bit, John, how did you get started in aviation and kind of what drew you to airports? So I'm going to tell you a little story that my mom used to tell me when I was a little kid. She said, I had two goals in life and, and you're not going to believe this. And she said, you've always wanted to join the Air Force, which I did. I spent 20 years in the Air Force. And she said, you Thank always you. wanted to work at an airport, which after I you know, retired out of the Air Force, I was fortunate enough to land a job here at Raleigh Durham International Airport. So wow. I've accomplished both of my goals that I set out to get. That's so, fantastic. So, so that's how I started in aviation, you know, and then sure. as the old saying goes, you know, once you get that jet fuel in your blood that you never get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. You know, being around different people, just different environment from an aviation perspective, you know, it, it just stuck. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Well, we're glad you made that choice. So you were talking a little bit earlier about the early 2000s. You know, that decade, not just for RDU, but really for the entire region, was really monumental. That was, you know, when the population started exploding here in the Triangle and really kind of all of the major urban uh-huh. areas of, of North Carolina, but, right. but particularly here. You know, as that decade goes on, like, tell us, like, how operations evolved then, too. So, you know, you've got a, a buildup of passengers, you've got a buildup of daily flights. Yep. So operations obviously built up from several different factors here at the airport. Number one, uh, we started adding additional flights. We started adding additional airlines. You know, passengers started expanding. The facilities at that time wasn't really conducive to handling that influx of people coming in. Obviously, I mean, we had a checkpoint. There was probably four or five lanes at Terminal terminal C at the time. Sure, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, a simpler time. Oh, right, mm-hmm. a simpler time. Yeah, and probably two or three lanes. Actually, we had two checkpoints over in Terminal A. Uh, a extension had, like, maybe two lanes, and Terminal A had, I'm guessing, probably maybe three lanes. So there wasn't enough infrastructure capacity to handle all the passengers. And actually, I mean, you guys have dealt with passengers before. They want to get what they want to get to when they want to get there. So from an operations perspective, we had to expand our department on various sides to, number one, take care of issues that occurred on the airport, and number two, support our customers. Because without the customers, there wasn't an airport. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you don't want customers to be um, irate. You want to make sure that customers are given the best service that they can possibly be given. So we would go over and help TSA after they took over the, you know, the responsibility of manning the checkpoints to process passengers through the checkpoint. And, and that would be either by line management. I recall on numerous occasions where we would go over and we would ask people who has the earliest flight. We would pull those passengers out and send them up to the front of the line. Mm-hmm. So obviously operations had a big focal point on customer satisfaction as well as maintaining the operational status of the airport. Busy times, but fun times. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's great. I think a lot of people who maybe have been exposed to day-to-day operations life um, think of those kind of topics like customer satisfaction as um, something that like revenue or communications or, or other departments might handle. But you guys are the front line mm-hmm. dealing with, you know, interacting with passengers probably more than any other department. Yep. And so that, that makes a lot of sense that, you know, something as simple as a line queue can uh, make or break a travel day. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, another thing, too, is that we have both internal and external customers. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, our external customers are, the, you know, passengers who uh, come through. But also, I look at our external customers as our airline staff, as our concession folks. You know, as, as anyone who has a business in a terminal, mm-hmm. you know, they want to make sure that they get the same level of customer service that a paying revenue customer gets, too. So, Again, they're here to provide that same level of service that our customers have. And my philosophy is that we should treat those individuals as we treat our outside customers. Because, again, they provide that comfort feeling uh, for a paying revenue customer. So if you treat those individuals with the same level that you treat, you know, airlines or anyone else, uh, I think that makes for a great day. It makes for a great business. And this is a good point to kind of really kind of pause. And for people listening at home, um, or if you're on your commute and maybe you haven't been to RDU in a while, I want you to picture how large the airport is. And on any given day, there's you know thousands of people here, not just customers, but employees mm-hmm. at the airport authority. There's employees at the firehouse. There's employees mm-hmm. in the terminals, you know, selling burgers and right. you know, and retail. Right. It is. It's a small city. It's and, a and city that, within a city. Absolutely. Makes, if 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 Mike Langeth is our CEO, is the is the mayor, that makes I think that makes you the town manager. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like all those things. That's have funny. To, all those things <laughs> have to happen all at one time. You know, and there's always a need for maintenance. Occasionally, there's a medical call that goes out, and you guys are really that that conduit that gets those things happening. Right. Yep, Jake. That's a good analysis. I don't necessarily look at myself as a town manager. I look at myself as you know somebody who recognizes that there is a need for service, whether it be you know our fire department folks responding to a medical issue, our law enforcement folks responding to a police matter, you know our maintenance team responding to take care of whatever they, they you know mechanical or, or infrastructure that needs to be responded to. So yeah, I, we, I guess we could say we are 
a town or city mm -hmm. within a city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mr. Langas will be, I guess, the uh, mayor. town mayor. <laughs> yeah. But I, I defer the mayor, the uh, manager for somebody else. I'm just the person who tries to get the right people to the right place at the right time. Sure. We hear you do that every month on our operations call. Jake and I sit there, and you definitely do lead by example and definitely wear many different hats as you're pulling together all those stakeholders. And one of your most visible roles at RDU is as our weather czar, or as I like to affectionately call you, my Dr. Doppler. <laughs> <laughs> monitoring hurricanes and snowstorms and much more you lead those calls which weather events stick out to you most in your memory as you look back so there was two that immediately come to mind one i'll probably say is the most that sticks out of my mind uh it occurred on december 25th oh, 2010 wow. Christmas. absolutely that's Merry christmas, christmas. <laughs> which happens to be my birthday by the way oh. and i got a call from the previous airport director mr brantley and said john you know, the weather forecast is indicating that we're going to have a pretty significant snow event. I said, Mr. Brantley, I've already seen it. I'm on my way. And, and what sticks out in my mind the most is that by the time that I had got to the airport, we had all the support staff that we needed to, you know, respond to the situation. Mm -hmm. And probably not a single person complained that it was Christmas Day. Wow. Which, sure. which is pretty amazing. I mean, you, you know, you don't get that opportunity to have a team that will come together and support whatever's going on without somebody complaining about something. Mm -hmm. But that didn't occur that day, which was phenomenal, wow. especially being on Christmas Day. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. that yeah. didn't happen very often. And How much snow? Well, I think we ended up probably having about six inches of snow. Oh, wow. Okay. So, you know, for the Christmas Day and the day after Christmas, we spent here at the airport. Wow, wow. That's great. Mm -hmm. And what about tropical storms and that kind of thing? Interesting, you should Lightning. ask that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, I actually got started in being interested in weather, uh, actually back in my days in the Air Force. I, um, my job when I was in the Air Force is something very similar to what I do here at Raleigh-Durham. I worked in what's called airport management or airfield management. And we had a weather station, which is right next to our office. So I used to go over and I used to talk to the weather guys and say, you know, just teach them a little bit about what weather is. Mm -hmm. You know, so they taught me like the six different types of clouds. Mm -hmm. You know, they taught how, you know, one front could have an interference or, or it could have an impact if it, hits another front. Mm -hmm. So when I started here at RDU, I used to watch the weather all the time. And then when we have what was maybe deemed a potential for a severe weather event, mm -hmm. and I will let just only a few people know, because obviously everybody that didn't have a support to, you know, uh, for snow operations, they didn't really want to know mm -hmm. because they weren't involved in the process anyway. Sure. So I, I would just send out what I, you, you call my weather reports Mm -hmm. And I will just take what the National Weather Service would, not just translate it into my own terms, something right. to make it easier for people to understand exactly. and read. And it sort of grew from there. I, I, you know, I sent it to a couple of people, and then I, uh, they were forwarded to a couple of people, and yeah. they forwarded to a couple of people. And then I guess as time went on, you know, it went from me sending my weather reports, as you call them, from 10 people to probably over 200 plus people exactly. now here at the airport. Yeah. Exactly. And it, you know, actually the airlines have all come back and said, we certainly do appreciate what you're providing us uh, because it helps them in their planning. And now, you know, I include our rental car folks, I include our concessions folks, I include our TSA folks, I include our air traffic folks, even though they get their weather on their own. So pretty much all of the businesses that here on the airport, I include in weather briefings so they can be prepared on what potential weather impacts could be. Yeah, and it makes a difference. I know for our communications team, we are, have that regular cadence of briefs, and we look forward to that as we try to develop some messaging and communicate with all of our stakeholders, both internal and external. So I definitely enjoy it, and you have definitely schooled me a couple times when I've called you and said, well, what does this really mean? Is mm -hmm. it really going to snow? Yeah. I can echo that. <laughs> I, I, took a, I remember taking a meteorology class in college, and I, I won't say the grade here. It was not a vowel. It was a consonant. <laughs> but um, okay. I will say that I learned, I've learned more about meteorology from from reading those reports and I did exactly. in that class for sure. Thank you for that. So the last comment I'll make about that just for a little bit of uh, knowledge. Typically if we get like a very uh, cold front that makes it across the mountains and you get like a high low I mean a high pressure with warm air coming from the south and at the two meet we will probably have a pretty good significant uh, weather event. 
Pay attention. Pay attention. Absolutely. You can rewind that one. <laughs> Listen to the <laughs> podcast again. <laughs> so, John, we've talked about a, a couple of different, you know, major events that you you staffed at the airport, whether it's a snowstorm or 9-11. You were here for a lot of those. I mean, literally every single one of the past 20 years. What, yes. What were memorable days or events at the airport that stick out in your mind? Or, or maybe even like events that you're most proud of your your team and how they work <laughs> through it. So, again, uh, obviously I'm, I'm going to uh, date myself back and say 9-11 was probably the most significant event that I, you know, um, participated in. Uh, just being here six months and then all of a sudden the entire aviation world shuts down. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got to find out places. Where I got to figure out where I'm gonna park all these aircrafts. Being new here to the organization, having a staff of three, you know, that, that was pretty significant. That was pretty <laughs> right. phenomenal. You I've know? seen and, pictures of the ramp that day. And it well, was, yeah, yeah, it was unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Wow. And, and then at that time, the uh, airport uh, director and his uh, C-suite, they were all in Toronto. Oh, were they really? They were really. Oh yeah, God, they were all in Toronto, know. and yep. they were not coming back. <laughs> not by airplane, right? <laughs> so it actually took them two days to get here. So obviously, you know, um, not saying that we didn't have the leadership, which we did, but it was pretty, pretty significant that you know we had to make decisions for the you know betterment of the airport as well as betterment of the uh, 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 aircraft that was flying and people that was on the airplanes at the time, uh, and probably um, maybe the second biggest events that I participated in, I don't do it anymore. It's the North Carolina plane pools. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Operations used to handle that many, many, many years. I think I've been here for 19 of them. And those were big, big events at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously with that particular event, uh, which is the single most fundraising event for the state of North Carolina in terms of uh, Special Olympics, you know, it, it, it made us all feel proud that we could participate in something that could contribute back to uh, people who are maybe have a different path in life that that we have. Exactly. Yeah. So those two events um, probably stands out the most. And you haven't touched on this, but having led the plane pool with you this year, I know that I tapped into you many times for different things. And you haven't talked about your work airside, but there was a lot of coordination that you did airside, whether it's coordinating with TSA, mm-hmm. but your team does that too. Yes. What kind of things do you do airside? So let, let's distinguish what airside means, because I know some of our listeners mm-hmm. may ask, them, what's airside? Yeah, well, here in the aviation terminology, we have what's called landside, which is your public access, you know, your roads, your terminals. And then airside is anything that is beyond the actual concourse itself out on the runways and taxiways. So my, me and my staff, our number one priority is to make sure that our runways and taxiways meet FAA standards, meaning that they are safe for aircraft to arrive and depart. Mm-hmm. You know, if there's any issues that we uh, could deem as a safety to flight, that we're responsible to make sure that, uh, number one, that people who are, are operating uh, aircraft are aware of what those issues are so they could take necessary steps to avoid them. And just as important as we get the right people in place to repair or or fix those issues, so it doesn't become a more hazard, you know. And that could be anything from you know mitigating wildlife issues to um, replacing a concrete slab or you know putting down the correct paint on a taxiway or a runway, opening know, and closing the runways every morning, opening and closing the runways, yeah, you know, mm-hmm. signs and markings. Now, I look at and as you deemed airside, it's like traveling down a highway. You know, you have signs and you have markings that tells you the direction that you need to go. Well, in airfields, the same way. They just have different signs and different markings, but it's all the same same uh, results at the end. Mm-hmm. You know, it gets you from point A to point B. Mm-hmm. Um, we're also uh, responsible for coordinating with our airlines to make sure that they have the appropriate uh, gates that they can park various size aircraft. Not all gate is one size fit all. So sometimes our listeners may, you know, fly in and say, well, how come we can't go to that particular gate there? There's no plane there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, because the gate probably is not built for that size aircraft. There you go. All right, so you have to wait to make sure that the gate that is available can fit the aircraft that you're operating on. So, mm-hmm. so listeners, next time you are um, at RDU or really just any airport, um, Correct. peek outside the window at your gate. You should be able to see markings along the ramp right next to where the jet bridge typically would be that um, sometimes you can actually see, like they'll, they'll indicate which aircraft should park it, their nose exactly where. So it's, it's really That's fascinating. Correct. It's it one of the little mm-hmm. hidden secrets that mm-hmm. I think novice flyers probably wouldn't recognize, but, but we, we right. deal with every day. Absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely correct. Mm-hmm. You just touched on a couple different functions of your department, and you knew early on that you wanted to explore this career in aviation. Is there any advice or information that you would share with someone who might be interested or, or you'd like to spark some interest in the industry? Um, 
I think working in airport operations, number one, is probably the best job in the aviation because you get the opportunity to, to touch practically everything that occurs on the airport, whether it's, again, whether it's your side activities or whether it's land side activities. You know, we get to interface with uh, our federal government, TSA, Customs and Border Protection, Air Traffic Control. We get to interface with our uh, station managers, different airlines. Uh, we get to interface with our uh, business concession teams, you know, our, our restaurant folks. Uh, we interface with our cargo operators. We interface with our fixed base operators. We interface with any and everyone that's here on the airport. What I would tell anybody is that if you want to have the experience of people contacting you because you are the focal point or you are the individual that not maybe not necessarily have the knowledge of, but want to know, know where to go to get that knowledge, then this is the uh, great job for you. It is never boring. Mm -hmm. It is never boring. Uh, I tell my team all the time, the schedule that you came in with today, throw it out the door because it's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. 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 I get that. We, we, we've seen it firsthand. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah mm -hmm. it, and it takes a level of, of experience to be able to walk into that situation and say, you know what, I know what to do here. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we know that you're, you're preparing to ride off into the retirement sunset here pretty soon. Where do you see airport operations as a practice going in the future? Like what's next for that field? Before I answer that question, uh, one thing I like to make a, a special note of is that, and I've done this throughout both of my careers, is that I always wanted to try to educate and train my staff to replace me at some point because obviously nobody's going to be in that position forever. Everybody's going to retire or leave or find something else to do. So I, I want my team to recognize that, you know, someday that I could be sitting in John's chair and someday you probably will be sitting in John's chair. And I don't want you to feel that, man, I am over my head. I am I, I am not prepared. I want my team to be prepared. Mm -hmm. So now to answer your question, Jay, where do I see airport operations moving in the future? I, I think that airport operations, number one, is moving in the right direction. You put people in the right place that know what makes airports work. And when things don't work as they should, they know how to get that process back up mm -hmm. or they know who to call. So they can get that process back to where it used to be or back to where it needs to be so it can function uh, as normal. Uh, and we're in the process of putting people in the right place so that can happen. And we'll have somebody here that has extreme knowledge, both air side and land side, and people that can respond when things go bump in the night or when things go, you know, catastrophic during the day right. or night, you know, uh, that our leadership team will feel comfortable that they have the right team in the place where the customer isn't at that impacted so much where we have an incident where things don't function yeah. and, and uh, customers are, are, are still supportive and customers are still happy to use all of you. That's where I see airport operations being that, that focal point to make sure that the airport is always open. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, John, we thank you for your service prior to coming to RDU and here at RDU. Your legacy is definitely going to be felt and missed. We're definitely going to miss you, but we thank you for joining us here on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. All right, Mary, another episode in the books. We have done it again. That was really great to hear from John. You know, one thing that listeners at home who haven't met him or been around his sphere, John just is so kind of universally respected and liked. Absolutely. Not just in the airport authority, but across the entire airport community, from the airlines to the people in the terminals. They know his face. They they talk to him on a regular basis. He is, we kind of joked with him earlier about being the town manager, but he really is. He it's, is. It's a, it's a special role that somebody like John can fill very well because he's just such like a wonderful, right. experienced guy. Right. I don't think there's ever been a time that I've called him with a question. And I've had some odd ones, some requests that we get <laughs> that he hasn't had an answer for me or didn't quickly put me in touch with somebody who could answer me. So yeah. he's going to be missed when he does retire, but we'll see how we can get him back here, right? Pull a plane. All right. So as we <laughs> sign off, please submit your airmail questions to us. We want to hear from you and find out what burning questions you have about RDU, airport life, aviation, you name it. Send those questions to us at communications at rdu.com and we would love to answer them for you. Absolutely. And make sure you leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. You know, we're trying to climb and pave our way here, but we, we want to hear from you. We want to know what you're liking, what you don't like, if there is something and how we could continue to grow so that you can tune in. Sounds good. See you guys next time. Take care. <laughs>